about now? Better? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, good evening again. Um, happy Wednesday. Um, we're going to get into uh, week two of our discussion and study of the book of Ecclesiastes. And um, just a bit of a review of last week. Um, I kind of initially mentioned that, you know, I like to call this almost a journal, uh, journal of Ecclesiastes, the, the journal and the writings of, of Solomon, uh, the main and really only character of this book, and um, the, his, his personal writings of his experiences, or you can almost call it a conquest of uh, doing everything under the sun and all these activities and all these things here on this earth um, apart from God, trying to find meaning, and then he gives his conclusions um, on all these activities. Um, so kind of some points we touched last week and, and some of the examples he used in chapter one. He uh, initially comes out and makes the declaration that, you know, says, all is vanity, everything under the sun is vanity, and he kind of tends to do that through some of these chapters. He makes his declaration and then explains how he got there and how he made that, how he made that observation. And kind of the four in chapter one he used is the, the passings of the generations, how generations come, generations go, and people are, are forgotten in time. Uh, he touched on the cycles of nature, what, which I thought was kind of interesting. He brings up the water cycle and, and you know, precipitation and rain and how waters move from rivers to oceans and it was 900, 925 BC, well before this was just something that was discovered. So um, pretty neat to see that. And then talked about the curiosity of man and just how the, the, the ear can never be, can fully hear or, or the eye can never fully see. Um, and then the absence of newness and how in this life, whether it be it during those times, 1800s, 1900s, the 20, you know, 2020s, there really is no newness. Uh, just a, a shallow layer of, of maybe the world looks a little different, but in essence, everything is still the same. and The same problems still exist. And kind of the conclusions he made is, uh, again, that all lifestyles are meaningless and everything is vain. Uh, when you take that approach, nothing will be changed uh, as, as hard as Mankind has tried over the years to make a perfect government and a uh, perfectly incorruptible government. Even here in the United States, we still struggle with that. And, um, and then talked a little bit about knowledge and wisdom and how it's ultimately useless and how it even brings pain, um, the de desire for more knowledge and how in time when you find things, when you find out more things, you find out things you don't really want to know. So um, just a quick review and how he sort of dives into this journal, if you want to call it in chapter one, lays out a pretty strong declaration of, of vanity. And uh, tonight in chapter two, we're sort of just going to continue on with that theme, and he's going to provide more examples and I guess more um, things and activities that he did to sort of support this claim. Okay, so we'll get into chapter two and just starting in verse one. Said there, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with, with pleasure. So enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility. And he uses that word futility, vanity, there's, there's different translations, but same meaning. And so I uh, sort of picture him, uh, picture this as just sort of, he's rubbing his hands together saying, you know, okay, I'm going to test every type of pleasure um, that I can fathom. And uh, this is going to be fun. I can, I have access, time, resources to do all this. Uh, let's get started. And um, you can kind of see uh, he, again, like the same pattern in chapter one, gives his immediate conclusion that, well, this is, this is futility. This is vanity. And then um, we'll start getting into how he makes those observations to back up that, that statement. So he starts off again, verse, or going on in verse two. He said, I, I said of laughter, it was madness, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? And some translations use the word mirth, and really, and, and laughter here, really the point being of just, we call it 
just merriness, cheerfulness, um, just overall trying to have a good mood and, and almost uh, laughable distraction in life where you can kind of laugh away life's cares and uh, responsibilities. Um, but he calls it madness. That's kind of interesting. What do you, what do you guys think of that conclusion when you hear laughter equates to madness? What is, how do we draw that conclusion? Or why do you think Solomon does that? Yeah, think about it as laughter in and of itself, comedy, um, you're almost kind of acting insane for a quick little moment. You're, you know. It does create, it, it does release endorphins. Sure. Right. Yeah, humor, amusement, um, those things are, are fun and, and good and temporal in those moments, but a, you know, in this format of trying to, de you know, I guess dedicate your life to that or set, set that as the, the climate of your life, uh, it's, you just become an unserious person and kind of mad and, and, and act hysterical almost. Dana. Silliness, yeah. And, and that is not going to accomplish anything. That's right. Yeah, you're, 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 you're an unserious person. Everyone likes a funny person and enjoys that, but if that's all you're known for in time, or unserious or silly person, you're, you're kind of uh, sort of annoying, I guess. I don't know. Totally, totally, yeah. So pretty obvious there. And then moving on to uh, verse 3, he says, um, he talks about the consumption of wine here. And it says, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what was good there for the sons of, the, for the sons of men to do under heaven, to do under heaven the few years that they have of their lives. So, kind of a, initially, when you first look at this face value, you, you kind of think, okay, of course, a life of drunkenness or stimulation from alcohol, wine, of course that's going to lead to some destructive life circumstances. Um, but it's important to note that, you know, these activities that Solomon was doing, all of these things he's experiencing, he was, from how I read it, he, he was doing this under God's plan or command or promise. God initially in Solomon's life was going to bless him with all this wealth and power and resources. And it says there, while, I, while my mind was guiding me wisely. Now, I wouldn't advise this for anybody that tried these things and, and say, you know, I'm going to just try these things, but under the, the umbrella of wisdom and, and authority under God. But there's an intention and purpose here with, a, with, with Solomon. He's in a very unique situation. But the point is still the same. The point he's trying to make here is a outside substance, wine, or any kind of substance to just provide a temporal feeling within the body um, is not going to provide, any, obviously, any kind of meaning or um, anything lasting. That one's pretty obvious, but it's just, it's kind of interesting Solomon's circumstance here of how he goes about doing that. And then he talks about um, until I could see what was good there for the sons of men to do under heaven. I kind of see that as he's, he's trying to take hold of folly and, I don't know, I guess, drink with the common man or sort of experience what the common man goes through, the folly of the common man. Um, but no comment there of uh, any kind of lasting satisfaction. Um, and to me, that's one of the more obvious ones. And then moving on to verse 4, he uh, talks about building projects. It says there, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. And I planted, them in all I planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. So, wow, that's pretty, to me, that's pretty cool. Um, 
I, you know, to see like a development of a park or major construction of an elaborate mansion or in farming you see hundreds or thousands of acres be developed with irrigation systems and ponds and these complex engineered design um, systems that can sustain an entire ranch. That's pretty amazing. I even just enjoy basic home projects like painting our room, you know, just basic things like that. Pretty cool. Bring, bring a sense of pride and um, kind of enjoyment and a fun thing to do certainly in life. Um, but ultimately, I've done, you know, a million basic home projects, certainly don't have any talent. And uh, in time, the newness kind of wears off. And um, even something at this grand scale that Solomon has access to, this kind of power and resources, in time, it's still just, it's just sitting there. And uh, in time, it just wears off. And you're just looking for the next project. Janine. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, pour, he, truly Solomon is pouring every emotion and pouring all of his, himself and his feelings on these experiences into, this, into these writings. Totally, that's a good point. Um, and then finally, moving on here to um, verse 7. He touches on um, sensuality in general. He says, I bought male and female slaves, and I had homeborn slaves, I also possess flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and treasure of kings and providences. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. So it touches on several different things here. And I guess sort of when you think of these, you know, the, the label of sensuality, we sort of think about it in a a sexual context, and that in it is true. He mentions that here at the end, end of this passage, but it's really anything physical or anything that's um, physically stimulating, I guess, to our senses or to meant to appeal to us physically. And you know, I just try to think of this. You know, he had the I'm assuming here the the best service and was waited on to a T on anything he wanted, um, possessed many flocks and herds of animals, so I imagine, you know, all of the benefits at that time of having something like that, you know, his, his access to food, healthy food, good food, and, you know, protein at that time was probably something that is, was far beyond anybody around. Um, the collection of silver and gold and just the collection of things and rare treasures of all the different kings that were around him uh, entertainment from singers, and then any kind of sexual experience he would he could ask for, a variety he could ask for. Um, again, no comment there of ultimate satisfaction, peace, joy. Um, ultimately, you can see that it left him feeling bored and frustrated. Imagine that, you know. I, you list off these things, you, you plug in the modern versions of these things today, and you know, this is this this, in my opinion, is exactly what our culture today strives after. Like this is the model of success: money, fame, wealth, power, you know, sexual freedom, whatever. And um, left him bored and frustrated, in my opinion. And you kind of see that as we continue to read on. Go ahead, Justin. Mm-hmm. 
it's a, totally, it's a insane overload and relatively in a short amount of time of incredible wealth and pleasure that the human in and of itself is not meant to handle. And no matter what your circumstance and maturity level in life, without the proper context and grounding from God, and as we look further into, into the lesson, um, just sh almost shocks a person and, and can get them to do anything. And, and, and it's destructive. And all th you see that all the time. And it's happened throughout the generations, and it can, it'll continue to happen kind of a central theme here. So, yeah, a, a person in and of themselves is not meant to handle that amount of uh, pleasure in, in one life, even. Dana. I think one thing that I noticed as we've been reading through is that all of it is focused on himself. I made my work great. I built myself houses. I made myself water. I collected for myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this type of life where you're just solely focused on yourself, uh, again, just like the same sort of thing will happen with what Justin's saying. It, it's not meant, that, that is not meant how a human is meant to live. It would just completely distort your, your reality. Carrie. Yeah. Yeah, a Budweiser commercial. That's interesting. You mean to tell me that American marketing companies have figured out how to prey on this and oh, yeah. profit? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <coughs> that's a good point. Never, no, that's but for real. That that that's totally true. Um, so, and then. Um, and then kind of the fifth point here, in verse, starting in verse 9, he just says, Then I became great and increased more than all those who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor. And this was my reward for all my labor. So I just kind of called this one pursuing the good life. Um, he kind of, kind of interesting it there at the end. It's the first time I've really, you know, usually he makes a statement like this and says it was futility, it was vanity. I mean, we're not done yet, but here in this particular passage, he says, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor. And this was my reward for all my labor. And I think it's important to kind of distinguish that Solomon is not saying that these things uh, that he just listed they're not going to not make you feel anything. If you go through this, you're not going to not feel anything. It's not going to not provide you anything. It'll provide you something, and, and you, will, you will gain something, uh, maybe a small or a temporal sense of, like he says here, my heart was pleased. You can sit back and think, look at what I did with all my labor. But it's just kind of interesting how he sort of acknowledges that. You know, with laughter, you can feel the joy and the relief that laughter brings and sort of laugh away your responsibilities in life. Wine, you can numb out your pain or responsibilities in life. Building projects, you, the things that come with that are the feelings of pride and achievement for what you've built. Um, sensuality, the, the, all the different types of pleasures that the body can feel. And then, yeah, the, the security of living the good life. Um, he acknowledges all those things and lists them out. Um, but we'll continue on in verse 11. He says, Thus I considered all these activities, all my activities, which my hands had done, 
and the labor which I had exerted. And behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. I mean, kind of, I mentioned last week that term striving after the wind. What came to mind for me was like somebody who's wearing a virtual reality headset and is just sitting there playing a game. And I can almost just picture God from heaven watching people, even Christians who sometimes get distracted and go after this, this rat race of chasing these things. You almost just, you know, I just picture him seeing someone like in a virtual reality headset and just completely blinded and, and covering their face with, with these things of the world. Robert. Totally. There will never be satisfaction. There will never be a point that is fulfilled. Yeah, that's, that's really the ultimate point, is, is not dismissing the fact that these things cause a feeling, that they provide or produce something. The point is, and he, you know, he just said prior to this, uh, I mean, obviously, if you read it all the way through, you see the, the eventual determination that all is vanity, but he says there, there's a point I can imagine where he felt some sort of pleasure or pride, but as time goes on, that stuff, you just, every day you keep waking up to that same reality, and I could just picture him in his great mansion someday just kind of, you know what, I'm, I'm sort of back to square one here. And, um, you know, it's kind of like the, the, the question was, how, how good was yesterday's meal? You know, how good was yesterday's filet mignon? Well, it was yesterday. We can't, it, it's a weird thing, pleasure. Like, you experience it, and it almost just goes, like, right through you. You can carry the memory of it. You can remember the feeling of it, but it's, it's, it's not there. So, um, and that's kind of the point that, that Robert's making here is pleasures, sensual, ple sensual pleasures, or all these things that we just talked about, they can't be, the key thing is they cannot be, like, accumulated or inventoried or accounted for and taken into the future. Um, they are, it, like I said, it almost just like, it just goes right through you. They're here and then they're gone. And then like, if you spend time and just really think about that, um, it, in my opinion, it helps me sort of ground myself and not get distracted with some of these things and, and really look at them for what they are. And it sort of refocuses of like, you get so caught up in the day-to-day -day world and even as Christians, these things, will creep into your life and consume you a bit. And you look at it in these fundamental terms, as Janine was saying earlier, this, this way that Solomon is writing about these things, if you look at it in those terms, you really boil it down for what they are, and they're just fleeting things that go right through you, things that cannot be accumulated or stored. And kind of one other point I want to make is sort of, like, I think I sort of touched on it a little bit, but distinguishing pleasure in and of itself. I guess pleasure is, is sort of amoral. I mean, it was created by God in and of itself. It's not sinful. I think when we tend to read this, we think, oh my gosh, look at this disgusting, gluttonous, corrupt life that Solomon lived. And yeah, I, 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 see, I see that frame of thought. But the point he's trying to make here is not pleasure in and of itself is bad or evil or corrupt. Or it's, it's momentary. That's his point. But there is a distinguishing point we should make is that too much pleasure or pleasure that crosses the line or goes into sinful boundaries, which of course we're all aware of, aware of as Christians, is not only momentary, but that's the type of pleasure that brings guilt and shame. And I should have wrote on there too, if it's sinful pleasure, it brings separation from God and spiritual 
isolation. Um, so that's kind of important to keep in mind. He's not saying in and of themselves, you know, building projects or, um, you know, even, you know, a, a sexual relationship in the confines of marriage. That's something God created. That's something, you know, to glorify God over, but that certainly can be corrupted. And, and that's, that's kind of the distinction to make here. So I sort of made the comment earlier, you know, you ever hear that phrase, um, you're just caught up in the rat race, you're just living in the rat race, and you just kind of think about it, like the whole experiment of rats, they're just like mindless addicted things that are, they're experimenting on, and whatever substance they're using, they're just like running on that little treadmill, can't even think, they just want the next dose of whatever is in the experiment. And certainly sometimes, as humans, we can fall into that trap. And um, it's kind of important to, to think about this, but I sort of heard it said that there's no rats in, in the race for the crown of life. And um, so, you know, in the, rat, in the rat race here of the world, it's really a race of going towards what feels good and not necessarily what is good. Um, the race for the crown of life does not promise uh, that it's going to be a pleasurable experience. Uh, in fact, it actually promises that it won't. And I think all of us, to some extent, in some different degree, have experienced that and would agree with that statement. But it certainly promises uh, something that is good and something that is meaningful and can bring the satisfaction, peace, and joy that we all yearn for. And really, that's kind of the, 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 the ending point of this, these first several verses is that it's really a dead end. The sensuality of pleasure, uh, it promises much. Uh, it certainly has a lot of hype, uh, but delivers very little. And I think kind of the, the main point we've discussed here is that it's temporal. That's the underwhelming part of it. You can't take it with you. Uh, it changes very little. No matter how much I enjoy an experience or enjoy a meal or a sports game or a vacation, uh, I still got to go, you know, I come, I come back home and my life is still the same. I still face the same problems. It's probably not going to change anything in your life. And really, one other thing that we've touched on is when you dedicate yourself to this, you become a rat in that race. And it's a totally in, like, you can't, satisfy that need. It's totally insatiable. It's forever, you forever need it. Um, so something, something to think about. And sort of touched on this point, pleasure in and of itself is not wrong. It's simply just not the way to find true contentment and meaning. So, what are some things as Christians we need to pursue? And those would be things that do deliver on what they promise, things that make us better people or better Christians and satisfy, truly satisfy, that spiritual need that is really yearning in everybody. Those would be things like faith and obedience, kind of like the basic food and water fundamentals of what it is to be a Christian. Um, searching for more and deeper knowledge in the scriptures. I, there's a lot of people here that... Um, are a lot more wise and experienced and older than I am and guarantee they don't have any kind of full satisfaction uh, or full knowledge of the scriptures. And that's something to really commend and model yourself after. Uh, don't ever fall in the trap that you think you know it all. Continue to, continue to, to deepen your knowledge in the scriptures. Uh, fellowship with the brethren and encouragement of one another and then spreading the gospel just sort of kind of some fundamental points that we're all aware of, um, fundamental points we've all been taught, but maybe sometimes are kind of difficult and not necessarily the most pleasurable experiences, but truly deliver on what they promise. So that's sort of in the first 11 verses there, talking about pleasure and uh, this endeavor that he goes on, kind of a radical experience of pleasure and and sharing his conclusions and notes on that. Like you said, Robert, it, we may look at that and think that's just sort of an unrealistic 
story that no one is ever going to experience, but you don't have to go far to find those kind of things. And it doesn't have to be at that kind of level for them to creep into your life and, and provide the corruption that sadly ultimately was the downfall of Solomon himself later in his life as well. Yeah, if you really read it, yeah, the, the circumstances might be exaggerated in terms of our life, but if you really read it, the points are still the same. And they still stand true today, um, which is really the cool thing about this book. So, go ahead. Totally, uh, and he makes that point a little bit later, and that's the key to all this. That's, that's, it's not what you have, it's what you, your, your perspective on what you have. But yeah, that's, that's a good point. So let's get into, starting in verse 12. Um, oh, it's funny, I always worry that I don't have enough material. And I look up at the clock, and now I'm like, I don't have enough time. So <laughs> I didn't, there's 12 chapters and, and 10 weeks, so I'm going to have to combine a ch- couple of chapters, and I don't, have the luxury of splitting this chapter, so power with me here. Um, so starting in verse 12, he says, So I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do who will come after the king except what, he has, already been, what has already been done? And I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. So we sort of turn direction here, and... Um, Solomon says, okay, I'm going to focus my effort on living uh, wisely with wisdom. And I can see that it's clearly a better way to live than a foolish person. A wise person thinks, they analyze, they think critically. Um, And I don't want to be like the fool man who sort of lives in darkness and lives um, sort of sporadically. (coughs) Continues on with the second part of verse 14. Makes the same point. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. And I said to myself, as, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, you know, copy and paste, this too is vanity. Um, Maybe obvious, but what fate is he talking about here? Death, right? And he, he mentions it here in just a second. But you can just sort of, I don't know, I can just almost start feeling like what Janine says, you feel Solomon's emotions and passion in this writing, you can almost feel a sort of resentment building in this sense of like, why, why do we have the same fate? You know, if I decide to live wisely and so smart in my own eyes, you know, I, it's not fair that we both end in the same way. Verse 16, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool, inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten. And how will the wise man and the fool, and how the wise man and the fool alike will die? So I hated life, for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after the wind. What an encouraging verse, right? This is kind of one of the, 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 the little low points of Ecclesiastes as far as the mood, but it's crucial. 
um, and like I said, you can almost feel like a resentment that he's writing. Like, forget this, man. Like, all this work, and like, you mean to tell me I, I have to stand in line and, 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 uh, and face God next to this clown? Like, that's sort of his tone. And like, I could just, again, picture him realizing, well, look at all these things. Look who I am. Like, they're going to remember me for ages. I am Solomon. And I've got, I, I'm subject to the same fate as this guy. And, like, it's, it's so true today. Like, it is so true today. And let's just continue on here in verse 18. The same thing. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. For I must leave it to the man who will come after me. I must leave it. I have to leave it. So all that, all those building projects. Well, remember that point where he said, like, oh, you know, I, my heart was pleased. Well, that's gone. That quickly went away. And I don't know the time frame of how all these things played out. You know, this isn't like then week two I built the giant mansion, and week three I, I and I hated it. I'm sure it's stretched out over, a, you know, a long time frame, but. Even a young person like me, you can't comprehend how you're going to feel about fun and exciting things in your 20s and 30s, and you look back in your 50s and 60s and think, I was dumb, you know. Different circumstances, but the points equate. In verse 19, he says, and who knows whether he will be a wise man and a fool man, talking about the guy who's going to inherit his stuff. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which... I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Like, forget this. Like, I don't even, I can't even control, like, who has my stuff after I leave. Well, wait a minute. What about, um, you know, family businesses, dynasties, these sort of things? Yeah, those always turn out well, right? You ever hear the, 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 the story, the, the first generation find, found it, the second generation built it up, and the third generation sold it, or it all got litigated in court. And um, I can tell you that that's real life, because I've experienced things like that. I'm sure some of us have as well. Um, continuing in verse 20, therefore I completely despaired all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man who is labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to the one who has not labored with them. This too is vanity and a great evil, he says this time. Um, why, does he, why, why do you think this would be a great evil? What comes to mind? I mean, really all I can think of here is it's a great evil because it's a great shame that this wise and capable person wasted their life on these things. And, like, that's the ultimate irony is, like, you have to now leave all those things that you prided yourself so much on. You have to leave those for, you know, back and throw it back in the pot. But the great evil is that you wasted your life in focusing on those things. Um, that's because that's kind of the first time he'd really written that. When I read that, I think, man, a great evil, that's a pretty strong term. Ian. Hmm. Yeah, maybe going along, going along with that tone of, of resentment of this is wrong, you know, this is an evil, I, I, that's my stuff. And, and like, just the, I just picture somebody saying that to God in heaven. Hey, that's my stuff. Funny, huh? No one. That's a good point. That's a good example. 
Yeah, Carrie. I thought Rehoboam did a great job. <laughs> no, yeah, totally. Yeah, within a, a short time frame, you know, 40 years of reign of prosperity, power, and, and peace, and that's when, right after Solomon, is when things completely started fracturing between the north and south and, and all kinds of corruption. Um, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a great point, Kerry. Um, just interesting to hear Solomon really pour himself into these points. And um, just something to really think about um, for ourselves here today. And then as we go in here to verse, let me look here. I've got one more. So let me just finish up here with verse 22. For what does a man get in all of his labor and striving with which he labors under the sun? Because all of his days are tasked, uh, all of his days tasked as painful and grievous. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. So, you know, this has a mental, emotional, taxing um, reality to it, this lifestyle. And again, um, I've seen this firsthand in working for people who vehemently strive after this, this type of lifestyle. And it's, you sit back and you just think to yourself, what a, what a life. What a life. You, you, you are worth tremendous amount of money, you have a completely diversified portfolio of assets, and you are way more stressed than I am. And you're the owner, I'm the employee, and at the end of the day, I, I, I just go home, and I go to bed. And, and you are taking that stuff to bed, and you're not sleeping at night. And it's sad. It's, again, what a life. What a life. So that's exactly what Solomon was experiencing here. So, sorry to move a little quickly, but um, then going here to verse 24, sort of starts kind of putting a cap and, and, and a final observation on, on these points. It says, there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen, that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment <coughs> without him? So this is an interesting verse, um, kind of encouraging and, um, and, and crucial for us today is, you know, again, he's not saying that pleasure in our lives is something that should be completely avoided, that is bad, that is sinful. In fact, um, pleasure in its proper context, pleasure when we understand that it comes from God, is something um, we should be praising God for and, and be thankful for. And, and Solomon's making the ultimate point here that who can, who can enjoy, truly enjoy these things in life without him? Um, a building and, and all these great things, material things, they're just things uh, without God. Uh, with God, it's a completely, it, it's almost a color, colorless world. And from the perspective of a Christian, it completely adds color and meaning uh, to those things. And they can be truly enjoyed. Go ahead, Robert. Can't take it with you. Yeah, look at it for its proper 
for, for really what those things really are, and you have a completely different perspective and outlook on them. Totally. Totally. And, and kind of the point he's making here is the ability to experience this peace, this joy, this spiritual fulfillment that we're ultimately trying to find here in this book. It is not related to what we do. And you've kind of heard that phrase, hey, that's, that's just what I do. That's not who I am. You know, some people, what they do is who they are. Um, I work in farming, but that is not who I am. I like to think of myself as a father, husband, Christian, and, and that's like fifth on the priority list. And it's important to properly label who you are and not get that mixed up with necessarily what you do and what the accomplishments of what you do. Um, you know, that doesn't attach to you as a person necessarily. Um, the things we, let me just get through this here. We experience this relationship of joy um, in several ways. It, it, the ultimate source is obviously through God, through our hope in Christ, but salvation, the ultimate security of knowing how, how bad or how good circumstances are in life, we have a security of salvation. We have a, an understanding of where we can go past this life. Um, hope that comes, the hope of heaven, um, and, and the ability to face the end here in this life. Um, insight uh, into spiritual things, God gives us his word, gives us the ability to sort of understand maybe a fraction of his great, uh, great holiness and existence. But as, like we talked about earlier, continual striving to, to dig more into the scriptures, that insight is something that w where we find that peace and joy and, and uh, in, in a proper relationship. And then finally, love. We talked about serving, um, sharing or bearing one another's burdens. Um, those really are four fundamental keys for us, for Christians, of how we truly experience uh, some of this joy in our life. And the ultimate point here, Solomon is saying that satisfaction and joy and the peace of work and labor really should come from the inside out. Is You're not going to make your life better on the outside. It's not coming from the outside in. If you want your, your outside to improve, you start with the inside. And um, that, that's really what he's saying here is um, no matter what, where you are in your life, what you do, whether you're the CEO of Apple or the, uh, the cashier at Apple in the mall, this is available for everybody. It starts from the inside out. So um, it's kind of my, I apologize for having to speed through some of those points. Um, let's finish up here real quick with, with verse 26. For a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom, knowledge, and joy. While to the sinner, he has given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to one who is good in God's sight. This, too, is vanity and striving after the wind. So, um, kind, of, kind of putting a cap and in, in, in an end on this, um, you know, in the world, the only joy and peace you, you get is when you win, when you succeed. That's it. Um, as a Christian, you can experience that joy and that peace no matter the circumstance. And so, unfortunately, kind of had to speed through some of these things and skip some of the points, um, run out of time, but maybe we'll go over a few of these things next week. Uh, next week, we'll go into chapter three. That'll be an interesting chapter. So, went a little bit over, but uh, thank you for bearing with me. Everybody have a good week. So, thank you. <laughs>